Okay. Hello again, everyone. Uh, before we get into today's sessions, I really wanted to explain to you all a bit about the center and how the center came to be through a project called STEM. So I have a brief presentation for you, and then we're going to speak with our first guest, Julie Weaver, the executive director of the Maryland Council on Economic Education, and Robin McKinney, co-founder and CEO of the Cash Campaign of Maryland. So bear with me for just a moment while I share my screen, and we'll get started. All right, so we're going to talk a bit about the financial education continuum moving forward together. So there are three questions that I wanted to answer for you all today to begin today's uh, program. One is how did we get here? The second is where are we now? And the third is where are we going? As for how we got here, I'm going to give you some background on the SPIN study. SPIN is short for Campus-Based Financial Education in Maryland a survey of post-secondary institutions. And now you all know why we call it SPIN. <laughs> Next, where are we now with a brief bit of information about financial education at the federal level, and then zooming into federal financial education at the state. As for where we're going, I wanna share with you more about the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness and the continuum of financial education in Maryland, how we can move forward together. So just a bit about SPIN. SPIN set out with a two-fold goal, the first of which was to conduct a statewide review of financial education offerings provided by post-secondary institutions to examine three areas, personnel, content, and service providers. The second piece of that purpose was to gauge interest in building a statewide network of campus stakeholders to collaborate on future financial education offerings. As for our process, we started large, looking across the nation for the best and the brightest financial education programs. Then we conducted a state scan of looking at universities and college websites, searching for terms like financial literacy and financial education to see what was happening and what was posted online. From there, we conducted a survey and then in-depth interviews. And I'll tell you a bit more about our population. As I mentioned, we assessed three categories, personnel, meaning who's working on campus dedicated to the work of financial education. The second space was content. We were looking for any information or resources that were currently shared with students and contained information about personal finances. And lastly, with service providers. We were looking to see how many institutions had contracted with external organizations to provide information, resources, and perhaps even counseling. Thankfully, we were able to hear from 38 individuals representing 29 institutions within the state, including 12 from the University of System and our University System of Maryland and our four-year public universities, 13 community colleges, and four private institutions. As for our findings, there were several. I'm going to give you a brief um, just overview of those findings. The first is a positive one, and that's that most institutions offer some form of student financial education, but some form could range from a pamphlet to having um, a completely dedicated full-time employee uh, working on student financial education. Our second finding is that participation in financial education is mostly voluntary. Uh, very few students are compelled to participate in activities related to student financial education. Also, this one was not a surprise. Student financial education is most commonly owned by fin financial aid offices. This next one was quite a surprise, and that's that external partners include banks more so than nonprofit organizations. We also found that few institutions have a full-time position dedicated to student financial education. Their most common challenges include student participation, limited budget, limited staff, as well as content resources. Most institutions have resources designated for students experiencing a financial hardship. And although this work began pre-COVID, uh, this year has just reinforced how important it is to have emergency aid available and accessible to students. Looking forward, most participants expected that institutional resources will remain the same or higher in the next fiscal year. And we're referring to resources um, dedicated to financial education for students. And lastly, most participants, 76% actually, reported interest in joining a coalition of educators and administrators to develop coordinated and or collaborative opportunities in financial education. It's also worth saying that those who responded no to that question, uh, more than half of them said, you know what, I don't personally have the time for it, but I'm willing to send a member of my staff. So again, overwhelming response to um, our question about working together. And I'm pleased that all of you are here today and we take the first step forward in that collaboration. As for our recommendations for SPIN, 
the, the study came up with six recommendations. The first is to embrace a more comprehensive approach to financial literacy, going beyond financial aid. The second is to identify a campus champion to lead financial education, but to employ a collaborative approach. Third is to consider implementing a mandatory financial education component with that decision being left completely to campus-based administrators. The fourth recommendation is to establish a statewide network of post-secondary financial education professionals. Our fifth recommendation is to invest in the professional development and career paths for financial education staff. Our sixth and final recommendation is to document and disseminate information about the most robust student financial education programs within the state. So in phase two of uh, this project, we focused on two recommendations. The first is about establishing that statewide network. And we cast a wide net here, looking across the nation to find out how financial education uh, professionals were getting together. We were happy to find the Texas Association for Collegiate Financial Education Professionals, as well as the Higher Education Financial Wellness Alliance, which is a national alliance based in Indiana. We also looked at Stand By Me, a public-private partnership in the state of Delaware. And throughout this process of learning how financial education professionals were getting together, we also began to hear from faculty members who wanted to be included. So the work has expanded to go beyond administrators. Now we're involving faculty, so that's great too. Our second recommendation um, that we're focusing on is to document and disseminate information from the most robust programs within the state. And as someone who's worked in financial education and wellness on a college campus, I can tell you that this is invaluable. To be able to find what other people are doing um, and repeat it is very useful. And it removes some of that stress of trying to reinvent the wheel. Our phase one highlights included several programs. At the community college level, we were so pleased to see Cecil College and Harper Community College. Both, of, um, both campuses have ongoing relationships with uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground Federal Credit Union. We also um, highlighted Montgomery College and the existing relationship that they have with the cash campaign of Maryland. At the four-year level, we focused on Morgan State University and the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Both um, institutions are ones that actually have an employee that's dedicated to student financial education. And at the graduate professional level, we highlighted the University of Maryland Baltimore School of Social Work, which has a number of programs, including student financial well-being fairs, and um, all of these institutions are doing amazing work, and we want to share more information with you about their work so that perhaps you can replicate it on your own campuses. So as for the institutions I've already mentioned, we covered many of the four-year public institutions within the University System of Maryland many of our community colleges, and also um, we've reached out to the Maryland Independent College and University Association. We are beginning to uh, work with for-profits and career schools and definitely want to delve more deeply into that audience. As for public agencies and interests, we have been um, just, uh, I'll say, lucky and blessed to be able to connect with the Maryland Higher Education Commission, the state's Financial Education and Capability Commission, and also the Office of Federal Student Aid. We've also engaged lenders and servicers. So this is far reaching work and we really wanna bring everyone together to advance collegiate financial wellness. At the federal level, I just wanted to share a few resources with you before we dive down deeply into the state of Maryland. The United States has a financial literacy and education commission. You can visit them online at mymoney.gov. The site includes resources for researchers, teachers and educators, as well as youth. The commission also publishes the National Strategy for Financial Literacy, the most recent one being in 2020, and you can find that online again at mymoney.gov. There's also the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau located at consumerfinance.gov. There's plenty of consumer education information there, uh, data and research, and they're also probably more widely known for their willingness to take consumer complaints, and I can attest that they're good at doing that <laughs> and bringing about resolution. Finally, uh, the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Federal Student Aid has plenty of resources and you can find them at studentaid.gov. There are checklists for academic and financial preparation. There are also tools for career exploration and labor market research. There's financial awareness counseling and there's a loan simulator to help um, borrowers navigate repayment more effectively. As for Maryland, we have several organizations that are involved in providing financial education to individuals at all phases of life. 
The Maryland Council on Economic Education focuses on K-12 K students, whereas the Cash Campaign of Maryland is focused more on adult financial education services. And over the course of this STEM study, we saw um, this gap for students who are in the post-secondary space. And it's so imperative that we address this gap because the financial concerns of this group are unique and can have lifelong implications. So to share with you a bit about the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness, we'd like to support informed decision-making, financial wellness, and student success. So two questions have been kind of on my mind as we begin to pursue this work more deeply. The first is how can we work to support informed decision-making during the college and career school financing decision as well as student loan repayment? The second is about working to support financial wellness as an essential ingredient within the campus-based student success initiatives. And our answer is to harness the power of our network as well as our existing resources. As I mentioned before, federal student aid has plenty of informational resources for students in addition to billions of dollars invested in students pursuing post-secondary uh, education. The state of Maryland also has several agencies um, that work in this space, including the Maryland Higher Education Commission, which also provides a large amount of aid, direct aid to students and their families. We also have tons of talent and resources on our campuses. So it's really important that we get to know those of you who are working at our post-secondary institutions and learning centers and combine this to advance uh, collegiate financial wellness. I look at the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness as a resource to accomplish many things. First of which is to help campus personnel create and grow student financial wellness programs. We'd also like to develop credible information and services for student loan borrowers. We'll facilitate information sharing via the statewide network after today, and we'll also coordinate efforts where possible. As for our vision, it's a pretty ambitious one, but I'm all in. All college and career students in Maryland are, first, credit worthy. We want students to develop the life skills necessary to manage their financial obligations, including student loan debt. Next is ready. We want students prepared for the financial responsibility and academic focus of collegiate education and ready for success on the first day of each academic term. Next is resilient. We want students to be aware of and have access to campus and community support services that will help them overcome obstacles to collegiate success, especially in the event of an issue that requires emergency financial assistance. Fourth is empowered. We want students to enter the financial marketplace capable of making informed decisions and protecting themselves against fraud and exploitation. Fifth is successful. We want students to complete a degree or credential program and fulfill the purpose for which they enroll. Sixth and finally is thriving. We want students to complete their collegiate experience prepared to set and achieve personal financial goals that are in line with their individual preferences, circumstances, and priorities. As for our mission, the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness fosters a continuum of campus-based financial wellness programming and supports that build financial life skills and empower students to thrive. The center recognizes the challenges to financing collegiate education and promotes informed decision-making for students and families at critical decision points, including the college career selection choice and the borrowing and repayment of student loans. The center will execute its mission by first, providing educational resources to prospective, current, and former students with an emphasis on serving students who traditionally lack access to high quality financial education and face the greatest financial barriers to matriculation, completion, and or student loan repayment. Second, coordinating a statewide network of college and career school professionals and providing guidance on how to create and or grow high quality campus-based financial wellness programs. Third and finally, advocating for investment in programs and implementation of, apologies that will, of policies, excuse me, that advance collegiate financial wellness. And with that, I'd like to take you into our panel discussion, the financial education continuum, moving forward together with a special focus on Maryland. So at this time, I will invite Julie Weaver, Executive Director of the Maryland Council on Economic Education, and Robin McKinney, co-founder and CEO of the Cash Campaign of Maryland, to join me for an exciting round of Q&A. How are you all doing this morning? Good morning. 
Good morning. Good morning. Great. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Yeah, you all have to excuse me. I'm old school. I have my, my questions in, <laughs> on paper and I'll probably jot down notes because even though I know you both, I know that I'm going to learn more about you and your organizations today. So Julie, I'd like to jump in right in with you to tell us a bit more about MCEE's resources. According to your website, you offer free resources and training to public and private K-12 teachers to improve the quality of instruction. And you recognize public school teachers, community champions, and outstanding organizations who deliver financial education. So tell us a bit more about how MCEE collaborates with other organizations, including the Maryland State Department of Education and the Cash Campaign of Maryland. Sure, I'd love to. And thank you so much for having me here today. It's a real honor to be a part of this program. And we're so excited to, so to see you launch the Maryland Center for Collegiate fin Financial Wellness. As I mentioned in the introduction, it really fills a critical gap in um, building skills for a better community for Maryland going forward. So um, thank you so much for, for creating it. And again, I'm so excited to be here. Um, our work, like the work of many of you and the colleges and universities throughout Maryland, is based on partnerships. Um, and so we partner in our work with the Maryland State Department of Education really to understand um, what's happening in the education community throughout Maryland and to help build programs and resources to address those needs in our school systems throughout the state. So it's critical for our work to be in close connection with the leadership of MSDE, as well as the content leadership so that um, we can understand where education is headed, what the priorities are, and, and be ready to serve as a, as a resource to help further financial and economic education for Maryland's K through 12 community. Um, on the flip side, we work closely with um, the Cash Campaign of Maryland because we serve different communities, but we all have the same goal. So everyone really wants to see the strengthening of our communities throughout Maryland and financial capability for all, which provides a better future for the state, for our workforce, really for um, addressing some of the, the economic needs that we have throughout our communities. And so we, we've learned and understand, and I think Robin could ad address this as well, that. One organization can't really serve everyone's needs. Um, and so it takes sort of a village to, uh, to move the ball forward. And so we fill the need in the K through 12 space and then rely on our friends and partners in, in the cash campaign and now in the college space to really help understand and address the needs of other, um, other community groups and age groups throughout our state. Thank you, Julie. And you know, my relationship with Robin actually began on a college campus. <laughs> so Robin, at this time, I'd like to ask you to tell us more about the CASH Campaign of Maryland. CASH, um, for those who aren't familiar with it, stands for Creating Assets, Savings, and Hope. I'd like for you, um, in your explanation, to take just a, maybe an extra moment to expound upon hope. And what, um, how does hope show up for you in the process of helping your clients create assets and savings? Well, uh, congrats again on the launch of the center. It's been so exciting to see it um, from the beginning. And now um, we've talked about this a lot and now we're here and people showed up to the party. We were not just sitting around with uh, all the food. So um, congrats. <laughs> uh, uh, cash promotes economic advancement for low to moderate income individuals and families across the state of Maryland. So we provide free tax preparation, financial education and financial coaching as well as screening for public benefits. Cash and our network of absolutely awesome partners, uh, some of which are on the call today, serve almost 30,000 households annually, most of which earn less than $20,000. And Cash focuses on directly providing these financial wellness services, um, but also supporting a network of partners through training, technical assistance, staffing, and direct funding. So this idea of a center really resonates for us um, to make sure that staff have what they need in order to do their job. And while programs are a really important part of helping individuals and families to build uh, their own financial stability, we also need to work with the systems and policies that create economic opportunities and barriers. So we work with various state agencies and local agencies to both embed financial capability services, 
look at policies that create barriers and build awareness of this sort of intersection of financial wellness with everything, right? With education, with workforce, with housing, with special populations like foster youth or older adults. So um, making sure that we have a annual state policy agenda that um, gets us to a level playing field um, that helps to bring tax credits to working families to protect us against predatory lending, but also creates opportunities like to help families save for, for higher education. Um, so for, for us with HOPE, um, it's not just part of our name uh, uh, with creating asset savings and HOPE, but for us, it's really about our value that our, our sweet spot, right, is on the emotional side of financial decision making. And I think this is my background as a social worker and Sarah, who's our CEO as a social worker, lots of people can talk about math. And there's a lot about finances that have to do with, you know, sort of the math and, and the ability to read and write and understand contracts. But thinking through how and why we make decisions and how to process those past issues is really what gives people the motivation in order to move forward. Um, and so I think when people really can see and understand how and why they make decisions, it can, it's, it's really empowering for them like, oh, okay, now I see what's, what's been happening. Um, but again, while, while information is power, so is explaining the, the systems and the policies, which are oftentimes um, set up to work against us. And I think it brings people a lot of relief when they hear that other people like them have had similar struggles and that by working together, we can overcome them. And I think that that is where the hope comes in. Hope is like the gas in the tank, right? To keep us motivated all the way to the end. Okay. I think I might have to posterize that, that hope is the gas in the tank. Who's <laughs> writing that down? I love that. <laughs> but Robin, you know, you made me think back to my time at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and the experience of having the cash campaign of Maryland come onto campus. We rented out a computer lab in the basement of the library, invited students to come and receive free help um, completing their income taxes. I'm not sure if you know of this experience, but during that time, we had a lot of employees who poured into those events. Um, one of the uh, employees that stands out in my mind was actually one of the facilities crew members. She came in, um, you know, was a little hesitant about sharing her personal information, but we were able to uh, help her complete her tax return. And during the course of the conversation, we found out that she had been paying about $500 to a tax preparer for a simple tax return. We also found out that she had been making payments on a student loan for her son who had passed away about a year ago, and she didn't know that those uh, loans could be discharged. So um, I, I really see hope show up in the work that you do. And I know that the difference that we can make with financial education um, from K-12 through the post-secondary space on up to adulthood, um, it's just very impactful and it really reinforces that message of hope. I'm so glad that you brought up the policy angle because that's where my next question is going. Uh, outside of providing direct services to Marylanders, CASH has the unique responsibility of staffing the state's Financial Education and Capability Commission. I'd like for you to tell us about um, some of the agencies and organizations that you work with and how they're represented within the commission, as well as how the work of the commission is reflected in the higher education experience for Maryland students. Sure. And, you know, we are so lucky to have incredible co-chairs who have been with us since the bill first passed in Delegate Stein and Senator Klossmeyer. So I thank them for their incredible leadership because it was an idea of uh, three of us, I think, uh, sitting over lunch one day as all the best ideas come up with. Um, cash campaign uh, was actually the idea over a plate of pierogies uh, in Fells Point. So, uh, you know, it, all, all good things can happen uh, when food is involved. Uh, the Financial Education and Capability Commission was created by legislation in 2012, and it's one of the few standing commissions. So this isn't a temporary task force that reports back and then their work is done. Um, there was a previous task force that was specifically looking at K through 12 financial education that I think gave us the seed to say, this is such a big topic. There are so many pieces that a standing commission, um, which is not an easy thing to pass. Um, you know, because it's creating new infrastructure in the state. Um, and one of the ways that we got that passed is another unique uh, situation, which is that cash is the staff for the commission. Um, so we are one of the few, if not only non state agencies that staff the commission. And we're really honored to do so because the conversations there have been incredible. We have um, a set of different state agencies there. So Department of Housing and Community Development, um, uh, MHEC, the Higher Education Commission, 
the Commissioner of Financial Regulation, which is under the Department of Labor, the Treasurer, the Comptroller, the Attorney General's Office of Consumer Protection, the State Department of Education, Department of Human Services, uh, as well as the state retirement system. So we have a lot of state agency players, you know, from lots of different um, perspectives at the table, as well as um, uh, uh, people from, you know, the sort of outside of government. So banks, credit unions, um, various nonprofits, uh, funders, uh, CPAs, so the accountant groups and teachers. And the idea behind it when we were first coming up with the list is there are so many different elements of financial education and capability. Who, what are all the different types of voices at the table? Um, and as our co-chairs mentioned at the beginning, student loan debt became the very first thing that we've worked on. Um, but since then we've looked at, we've always had, had one sort of North Star around college uh, and you know, post-secondary education, affordability, student success, um, stopping predatory practices, but also looking at you know, all the things like from auto insurance to the fines and fees in our criminal justice system, um, all kinds of different, um, all kinds of different topics. And so it's nice to have a standing commission because you can take a long time to delve into the different items. And one thing that we're doing that I just want to plug because it'll be coming out this year is just like SPIN did an awesome annual, uh, did a survey. We have a survey that we do every three years to get, uh, get a sense of what is the state of financial education and capability services in Maryland. And this is one of those years. Um, so we'll be releasing that in the fall. Um, so we will encourage everyone to fill that out. Um, and all of our meetings are open to the public. Um, and right now, obviously, because of COVID, we're doing them all virtually. Um, and we have recommendations that we send to the General Assembly by December 1st in a report every year. And all of those reports are also publicly available. Wow. Thank you, Robin. Um, you just reminded me, I really need to brush up on my knowledge of all those alphabets and those state agencies you rattled off. <laughs> so that's on my to-do list. Let's shift back to Julie. Um, MCE is actually headquartered on the campus of Towson University. So tell us a bit more about how the center uh, fits within the TU community. Sure. So we, our organization was created six, 65 years ago really by higher education professionals to address the need of greater financial and economic education for school children. And so we've had a tremendous partnership with higher education from the beginning. Um, and we, our home has been at Towson University for the last couple of decades. And we're so grateful for Towson's support and, and the support of Delegate Stein and Senator Klaus Meyer at the state level for advocating for resources for the council to deliver our work. Um, Towson's our biggest supporter and partner, and we have a great working relationship in that our president here at Towson is very engaged in community engagement activities. As an anchor institution, Towson is very involved in outreach and MCEE is a big part of that outreach effort into reaching in to the local school communities to offer resources, as well as we do a really wonderful field trip opportunity for students. We bring classes to campus here at Towson University um, to take a tour, have lunch. They always love the ice cream. Um, and then we do a lesson with them on saving and investing in the finance lab in the College of Business Economics, which uh, College of Business and Economics, which is where our organization lives on campus. Um, and I really think that it's been a wonderful opportunity for us to engage Towson students in internships here with our organization. We also work closely with the um, various clubs that have to do with financial education. The, in, the investment club here on campus has been wonderful mentors to some of our um, investing work that we do with students. And so um, we continue to collaborate closely um, with Towson and, and just are, are really grateful to be part of the community here. Wonderful. So Julie, I have a follow-up question for you, and that's to tell us a bit more about MCE's impact. Um, according to your website, MCE has reached 23 school systems. Additionally, it has served more than 11,000 teachers. That's a lot of teachers during the past five years. Um, tell us about the importance of recognizing the diversity of the school systems, their size, their locations, student populations, and their teachers, and how those unique characteristics shape the delivery of financial education through MCE's programs. 
Yeah, sure. Taking a little bit of a step back to tell you a little bit more about what we do here at MCE, there's really three key areas of focus that we have. The first is to support the K through 12 community through providing the expand resources and professional development for teachers to expand financial education and economic education in classrooms. And in addition, we provide hands-on activities for um, students that can be used in classrooms and in community organizations too, that provide what we call transformational learning, but what I consider really important for behavioral change because all of our initiatives are really meant to change behavior so that when students go off to college or career, that they're really prepared financially to make those critical decisions that are so important to the trajectory of their paths. So, and, and in addressing your question directly, um, we also work with the Financial Education Network to convene individuals and organizations who are interested in expanding financial education. But how we work is really through listening. I mean, we partner with each school system to really sit down with their administration in their content areas. We work in math, we work in social studies, we work in CTE, um, we've been working in ROTC. Really, wherever we can find a way to get more information in front of kids, we're engaging with those professionals in the school systems. And in Maryland, we have some of the largest school districts in the country. So being a county-based school system in, in public school here is somewhat unique nationally. Um, in other areas, including Pennsylvania, you have town-based school systems, but here we have um, very large bureaucratic operations to address education. And um, we're working closely to listen to what their curriculum is and how we can enhance what's happening in the classroom and really partner with them to create you know, a custom approach for their students and their communities. Wow. Okay. So thank you for reinforcing the need to listen <laughs> instead of just, you know, setting up shop and doing things, listening yeah. to the audience that we want to serve and hearing from them about, um, you know, how we can serve them best, which brings me back to Robin. Uh, Cash has a, a special way of reaching people through so many platforms and events. You have Money Power Day, the Common Sense Conference, um, and also managing several regional financial education coalitions. Many of our guests here today are in various stages of developing their own campus-based financial education coalitions. Talk about the process um, of arriving at the, the perfect mix of programs and events that meet the needs of your audience specifically. Sure, I don't know if perfect, uh, I don't know if all of our guests are perfect, uh, but you know, really what cash started out of was looking at opportunity moments, tax time being a big one. Um, and so, you know, for us that um, that is a moment where people are getting a lot of money, a financial aid application, right, another big moment. So looking at what are those opportunity moments, because a lot of the research around financial education says just in time financial education is more likely to stick. You know, when if you're going to talk to someone about home ownership and they're 14 and that's really far away, uh, you know, yes, you can talk about it in some ways, but it's not gonna lead to behavior change because they're not doing anything with it yet. So look at what those opportunity moments are um, in the lives of the people that you're serving, but also in the flow of your other work. You know, when are other things already happening? The more you can tag on to other things that are happening versus creating something standalone, um, you already have a ready audience. And so we did a lot of that um, and continue to do a lot of that. Um, the other um, piece is looking at how to maximize government benefits and credit, you know, and, and credits, tax credits. So right now there is a slew of things happening, right? Um, we've had federal and state stimulus programs, expansions to the earned income tax credit at the federal and state level, this new advanced child tax credit that just started going out July 15th. You know, how do you help people to maximize that moment? You mentioned the facilities person from UMB, right, who was paying $500. How can you think about, um, you know, helping people to, to not have to pay $500? So connecting them or offering free tax preparation um, or navigation assistance. There's a lot of need for that navigation assistance. These are really complex systems. And a lot of people, even if they're tech savvy, they're complicated. 
Um, so screening for public benefits, there is a 529 matching program called the Save for College program, helping people to get the word out about that, that they could be getting um, a match. Um, the other piece is looking at how to close information gaps and looking at both clients as well as staff to drive what those topics are. So for us, the three main ones that always come up are credit, savings, and identity theft, um, or just sort of scams. Those are just three that are just sort of parentally always come up that people have questions about. Um, one of the biggest pieces of advice I could say is be really clear about what your role is, both sort of in your marketplace and your marketplace is your campus and your community. So we're very clear about who we're not. So we don't do housing. We don't do credit counseling. We don't do bankruptcy work. We don't do legal work. And we refer to awesome partners who are doing those things um, out in the marketplace. So we're really clear that we're not going to be everything to everyone, um, but we build relationships with the groups that are. So when we make a referral, we can really explain to the, you know, the person, this is what you're going to get. This is what the service is. And we know that the quality that's behind it. Um, the other thing is to, to be really thoughtful about how you move into a new content area. Um, like for us right now, you know, we've been exploring small business work and there's a lot of people in that space and trying to figure out, we're not, again, trying to come in and say, all right, we're going to meet everyone's small business needs, but we're identifying a gap, which is tax compliance and record keeping. Um, that is a big issue for a lot of small business owners. Um, so think about how you can best serve people if you're going into a new content. Um, and I would say my last piece of advice is to really focus on building enduring connections and capacity versus transactions. You know, coming in and saying, well, we're going to offer an, a workshop one time for one hour. You know, what you're going to get out of that is some attendance, you know, maybe some light bulbs. But if you're really thinking about how to change you know, culture, how to change behavior, think about over time. And so we always look at quality over quantity um, when it comes to those transactions, when it comes to connections versus transactions. Okay, thank you for that answer, um, Robin. I wanna shift back to Julie and I'm looking at the time. I know we're winding down a bit. Uh, I wanted to ask you more about your professional experience <laughs> because, you know, there are many people who are participating today who are thinking about financial education. There may not be a, a, a fully carved out space for it on their campuses yet. So you have experience in the corporate arena, also in higher education and now with K through 12 education. So um, could you please tell our attendees about some of the transferable skills that may be useful for those who are new to financial education or pondering a transition from one space to another? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, my resume is a little, little interesting in that <laughs> career in uh, corporate finance. And then really honestly, between all of us at, at some point down the road, you know, I decided that making rich people richer wasn't really that fulfilling to me. And, um, you know, my dad grew up in foster care and my parents weren't well educated. So I was just very fortunate personally to uh, pick a job in banking in college. I was a teller and that really opened my eyes to a lot of um, what I didn't know and has led me sort of on this winding path that has culminated at leading the uh, Maryland Council on Economic Education. But um, some of the skills aren't surprising in a sense that, that have benefited me over the time. I mean, we've already talked about listening. I mean, being an active listener and really approaching everything as a novice, I, I still feel like the new kid on the block in, at, here at the council, um, as well as in this community. And I don't know that that'll ever change. So I'm, I'm constantly trying to listen and learn um, you know, how I can do things better for our students and through the community. Um, I think collaboration, like what we're doing here today and what, what um, we collectively do in our jobs is, is so important because there's not enough resources out there to recreate the wheel all the time. So borrowing ideas from each other and trying to build on other people's work um, to expand you know, the impact is just so important and it applies really in any career path. Um, I, I feel like I always look for the most efficient way to get something done. And a lot of times that's looking at, you know, what other organizations are doing, 
um, and, and trying to adapt that, that success to how we do things here at the council and, and how I approach things. And then, um, you know, I see your, your sign on the back wall there, Tissa, that says, you know, begin with a grateful heart. Um, I had a, a mentor when I worked in higher education who was very focused on servant leadership. And, and that's something that I took to heart. Um, and, and really, you know, start every day thinking about, you know, that I'm, I'm here to serve others and our organization is here to serve. And I know ca the cash campaign is too, and we all sort of share this um, mentality that um, if you look at every situation and every interaction with, you know, how does this best serve, you know, our audience and our community, it really, um, I think, frames the way that you solve problems and um, you know, gets, gets more things accomplished. So, and, and then just your basic communication skills, you know, being able to talk to people, being able to build relationships. Um, those are great for anyone's career path, really at any stage of the game, that if you work on building relationships with people above you, people below you and people alongside you, um, they're only gonna help you um, in, in making a difference where, wherever you are at that, that particular point um, in your path. So that's, that's pretty much, I guess, in a nutshell, what I have to share <laughs> my comment. So. Oh, well, thank you, Julie. I just wanna share with you a comment from the, the chat. Uh, it says the concept of servant leadership warms my heart. And that's from Michelle Coates. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a comment from Dwayne Morgan to Robin, look for opportunity moments, what great advice. And from Gail, a reminder, please don't forget to tweet. We are at the MCCFW. You can tweet us using the hashtag MCCFW21 to continue the conversation uh, online. Um, let's see, we've got about six minutes left. So I'm going to ask a final question of both of you. And after that question, we're actually going to hear from a student, share their testimonial about their experience with financial education on campus of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. So for our final question, as we are emerging from what I hope will have been the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic, what makes you hopeful about advancing financial wellness for the population served by each of your respective organizations? And let's start with Robin. Um, I would say today, you know, moments, moments like today um, where we have over hundred people who want to know how to do this better, different, more of it. Um, you know, I started our predecessor organization that was called the Maryland Cash Campaign in 2007, right? Right when the recession was hitting. And when economic times are tough, people really care about this topic because they see that it's not just people who are already struggling, which by the way, we should be serving and helping, um, but that so many people have been impacted. It's an it's a opportunity moment for all of us um, to say, how can we help? And I think, again, underscoring your point, Tisa, about the facilities worker, you know, universities are huge employers, colleges are huge employers. And so how we're thinking about staff, students, faculty, everybody, there's no one who is immune from financial challenges. And the more comprehensive the approach we can take, the better. So whether that's, you know, offering a free tax preparation clinic on site, which is a great learning experience, you know, partnering with nonprofits to put interns in these different programs. So we have a strong workforce uh, coming behind us, right? I'd like to retire sometime. So I want people to uh, be able to take my job and we have open jobs right now that honestly, we're having a hard time filling. You know, we need a, a workforce that's ready to provide these types of services and who better than, you know, the people on this call to help us to get there. All right, Julie. So I would add to what Robin said by saying sort of the pain of the past of, you know, living through the pandemic has made us all so much more nimble in terms of how we reach people. I don't know about all of you, but, you know, last, say, February, I don't know how good I was on doing virtual conferences like this. And, you know, the best way to learn something is to be thrown in the fire, I think, and, and have to figure it out. And so now we're coming out of this with, um, you know, these great new skill sets on reaching people, you know, uh, virtually reaching people in person. So I'm really excited about coming out of the pandemic. As, as Robin said, you know, there's a renewed focus on building these skills and people are really paying attention now 
to the fact that we need a better financially capable, you know, citizenship here in Maryland. So the the um, the need that's always been there, I think, is more emphasized now, and people are more interested in addressing it. And I think we have new tools and ways and, and creativity in, in doing that and doing that work. So I think, you know, moving forward, um, all of our impact is going to be greater um, through, you know, the hard work that was done, you know, getting us all through the pandemic in our various jobs and organizations. Wow. And we also have another comment from the chat from Karen Gibbs of the Gibbs Perspective and also a friend uh, to Cash and MCE. She says, great job, everyone. I'm excited about the possibilities. Uh, I wanna thank you all so much for your support um, over the course of this journey. Uh, Julie, it's been years since we connected initially around SPIN and now look at us. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Robin, thank you so much for the support of the Cash Campaign of Maryland and for also allowing uh, the new center, the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness to operate under the fiscal sponsorship of the cash campaign of Maryland for the next year while we search for a, a more permanent home. So thank you both so much for your time. And please, before we go, can you tell everyone where to reach you, your website, social medias, and all that good stuff? Go ahead, Julie. Sure. So our website is um, econed.org. Um, our social media hashtag is MD Econ Ed, so feel free to follow us. We would love for you um, not only to promote us on your campuses, but if any of you are parents, promote us at your school um, and, you know, raise awareness about the work that we're doing with, um, with the K through 12 community. And you can reach me personally at, um, it's pretty easy. My email address is just my last name, weaver at towson.edu, and I'd love to hear from any and um, each of you about um, how we can work together. Great, and I just put um, mine in the chat, but we're at uh, cashmd.org, cash like money. And uh, on Twitter, we're at cashmd, and I'm Robin, R-O-B-I-N, at cashmd.org, and really look forward to connecting with us, with all of you. We are actively looking for students right now for our Maryland Fellows, um, Community Fellows Program, and we have multiple job opportunities right now that are on our website that we are desperately looking for good candidates for, for tax preparation and our financial capability services. So please help us find some good folks. Great, thank you all so much. And I just wanna, um, again, uh, just say how important it is to build this continuum and to also be on a first name basis with the people who are part of this community. Where else can you go where you're gonna get somebody's personal email address <laughs> for a group this large? So thank you all so much for sharing so much and being open to connecting with everyone who's here today. At this time, we're going to take a brief break to prepare for the next session. So please get up, stretch a little bit and uh, come back and we're gonna talk to Thelma L. Ross, the Director of Student Financial Aid at Prince George's Community College and Heath F. Carelock, who's the Program Director of the Financial Empowerment Center at Prince George's Community College. Thank you.